Well, I guess this will be my final argument in the Zimmerman trial. Like I've said in one video before, the one that actually made it up, is that I believe from the evidence, from Zimmerman's own words, and I listen. And I listen to all the stories he told. And I listen. And I'm going to skip to the end because I don't know how long this video is going to go. So I'm just going to skip to the heart of what I want to say. Everything sounded like he was baiting the police. From the, he's got something in his waistband. You know, he never, he said, we wrestled around, he never saw it. He said he got swung on. You know, I mean, you're screaming for your life. You draw your gun and you shoot somebody and you stop screaming. It's like, help me, help me, help me, help me. Help me. That's when the guy comes out of his house and says, Hey, you guys, stop. And yeah, Trayvon Martin, he was on top of him, and he was shoving him with his hands. He was shoving him to the ground. Because if he was punching him, the fist, he'd have way more injuries on his face. He'd be lumped, little knots all around his face from getting punched. Being shoved back down to the ground is what I believe was happening. This is only my theory. First of all, I believe Mr. Zimmerman is telling the truth. He saw the guy looking suspicious and everything. But to me, in Zimmerman's mind, Zimmerman figured they always get away with it. I'm going to catch one. And yeah, the cops will have him, and that's just another little punk off the street. But this time, with his intentions, his so called good intentions, he went and, and scared the hell out of a kid from the hood, from the ghetto. When you're from the ghetto and someone is following you with a car, driving slow behind you with a car, that's a drive-by. It's a robbery. Somebody's going to get out and rob you. So all those little intangibles and, and stuff like that, that's what a young black kid would think. Somebody's going to try to rob me. First of all, you're not going to take someone home that's trying to rob you. Now, in Zimmerman's defense, this guy's looking scary. Something's going down. But that don't give you the right. So, they're wrestling around on the ground. And I probably wish you could show you because I have the map on the screen. But the computer glare, you can't see the Zimmerman map there they have there. So, um, they're rolling around on the ground because Zimmerman is playing cop. He's going to tackle the guy because the police are on their way. He already baited the police by saying, this guy's got something. He's, he's not, you know. But the thing is, Zimmerman did not expect the kid to fight back. I believe this displays a laying in wait. He laid in wait for someone to follow the bait. You know, he got the guy curious by following him in the car. He may have followed that kid from farther than we think. And then all of a sudden, he sees the kid smoking. So now he knows what he's smoking. He knows this kid's up to no good. Now he sees the kid talking on the phone and looking suspicious. So now, there he goes. He's setting it up. So in his mind, he was playing the detective, the cop, and he was following protocol in his brain. But he's not a cop. So he's on the phone telling these people this cock and bull story about what he's observing so they know. But never once did he say, you know, I'm armed. If you come up, I'm wearing a red jacket. I'm armed. Don't be surprised. Because he could have got blasted by a cop if the cop would have saw him leaning over a bush looking at Trayvon and his gun was exposed. And also... Like I said, let's get back to the rolling around on the ground. The rolling around on the ground. 
you know, Trayvon is, you know, get dusty a little bit, then, you know, Trayvon gets on top. Because Zimmerman says, I don't remember when he got on top of me. So that means at one point you were on top, right? So once Trayvon got on top of him, I think Zimmerman had already went for the gun. But like I was saying, the kid was most likely holding Zimmerman down and pushing Zimmerman down. Because if Zimmerman really wanted to, he could have fought back. You just don't let somebody tackle you and get on top of you without fighting back. That's illogical. He never threw a blow. Okay. Right. They tussled around on that ground for almost two minutes, I think. That's what I believe. So, they're tussling and they're rolling around on the ground. Trayvon gets on top. Then Zimmerman screams. The neighbor comes outside and says, Stop that. I'm calling the police. And now Trayvon is shoving the guy back to the ground. And he hears the guy say, I'm calling the police. And as soon as he heard that, he eased up, maybe to get ready to run. Or maybe to like, yeah, the cops are coming, go get you now. And Zimmerman pulls the gun and shoots the gun. What is also strange is one of the witnesses says, Zimmerman, after the shot, was looking into the windows. Rewind it go back you can see that first lady got on the stand she heard the thing she's crying all that she saw the guy looking through the window now why would you after you accidentally shot somebody then look through a window why would you look through the window that that right looking through the window after you shot somebody to me is a sign of guilt what are you looking for you look for a witness so move forward so Zimmerman's looking through the window. Zimmerman also says he turned the body over. So all these different intangibles lead to why would you turn the body over? Because he thought that the young kid had a gun. He was hoping that he was a thug, but he wasn't. So Zimmerman now has already got his story because he's got three stories already made. He's got the story of, well, you know, I caught this guy looking around, and here he goes. Cops were like, thanks for catching the guy. But the moral of the story is the kid was innocent. If Zimmerman would have not shot him and he would have lived, Zimmerman would have been charged for false imprisonment. So, you know, then they would have found a gun, so that would have been kidnapping and false imprisonment or whatever they wanted to do. The moral of this is he was told not to follow somebody who he was already following before he even made the phone call. Why would you leave on your way to Walmart with a loaded gun, one in the chamber, on hair mode, pretty much? It's a hair trigger. When there's one in the chamber, you just have to pull the trigger. When there's not one in the chamber, you have to pull the trigger harder. He was on hair mode. There was one in the chamber, chamber ready to go. He's on his way to Walmart, strapped and ready to go in Walmart to get sandwich meat. That makes no sense at all. I'm on the way to the store to Walmart and I see somebody hanging out. Okay, I'm going to go all the way to the store and if he's still hanging out, then I might say something. See what I'm saying? He stopped knowing that he had a gun to investigate something that he deemed suspicious. Didn't once say he had a gun. Didn't once say, I'm neighborhood watch. Do you need help? The story, I believe, by baiting the police in the beginning, because I know I jumped all around, and it's like, come on. He told the police what was going on. He knew he had a gun. If he would have walked up with the gun out saying, freeze, the kid would have froze, would have never moved. So think about it. In these final statements, I believe Mr. Zimmerman saw someone, thought they were a suspect, in his mind he was not gonna let this person go by any chance by any means I'm gonna catch this person and hold this person till the cops get here and the person wasn't willing to be caught the person was actually innocent the person actually thought they were being followed chased and were going to be robbed so they defended themselves and by defending themselves they died 
Mr. Def uh, Zimmerman defended himself and the other person died. He escalated the situation by slowly driving behind somebody, then getting out and following the person. The person runs, then he goes to find an angle to where the person was. When the person got up close, he should have identified himself. I'm working with law enforcement. Can I help you? You look lost around here. He could have said, I'm security. Can I help you get home? He could have said a hundred million things besides, what are you doing around here? What are you doing? You know, you've already chased somebody into a corner. Of course they're going to come out scratch. Of course Trayvon was on top. Zimmerman was found out. If this person is innocent and I've done this, I'm in trouble. Plan two, fire the gun and say you had to defend yourself because he did have to defend himself. You picked a fight knowing you had a gun. You went to pursue somebody knowing you had a gun. I'm armed. Stand down. He could have said anything, but he didn't. He chose to take the route he chose, and the outcome, the outcome became the way it is. That is my final, my final thoughts. Is that self-defense? Is that murder? That was somebody angry enough to defend his neighborhood. We applaud somebody who would do that. But we also love for if this was going to be a tragic incident, at least let it be like the uh, incident with the guy who shot the two burglars. Stand your ground. I think his name was Hill or Hall. I forget. And this old man came and blasted those people after the cops told him not to. So you think about this and you think about that situation. This person was following somebody in the car. The kid could have ran home. The kid could have dialed 911. But who takes someone to their house? Um, which 17-year-old would dial 911? Especially if he had a roach or a joint or some weed or something in his pocket. It's the perception that black people go through. Some of this we bring upon ourselves. And some of this is a built-in American experience. Those are my closing arguments. Those are my final statements. I believe that this man is guilty of poor judgment and just plain old ignorance. And for that, that's like a manslaughter to me. Murder, maybe. Maybe he was uh, cold-blooded enough to manipulate the entire system. Him and his wife both took these classes. They both studied. His father is also a judge. How much of that privilege will kick into this? We don't know. You make your own call. You make your decision. Guilt or innocence. The final arguments. The final arguments. The final closing statements of the real AIX. Thank you. You've been tuned.